these are the things that these are the things that came about on our watch. I'm 60 plus years old. So these are the things that came about on our watch. But our black political class has very little to say about them. They're still stuck celebrating the 60s. And you would guess that nothing happened for them between the triumph of the civil rights movement and the election of Barack Obama. Nothing. Because that's just the way it is. So that's, in a nutshell, that's who we are and that's what we are. We're about conducting and engineering and furthering a dialogue among black folks and about black politics and about the direction of black politics and black life that's honest, that takes into account the class divisions within black communities because we think these are important. We think that we've got a black political class right now who, in Atlanta where I live, they'll call press conferences to defend the rights of black contractors. At the same time, okay, at the same time the mayor is cutting the pensions of black city workers. So that's the kind of disconnect that we're fighting against. And uh, that's the kind of honest dialogue we're trying to promote. And thank you all for supporting us this far. And we hope to be around another few years. And this other guy on the stage with the black scarf around his neck doesn't need an introduction. But, so I'm not going to introduce him. <laughs> I would hope that uh, Brother Cornell would also have a mic, or else would be at a very stark disadvantage <laughs> in this dialogue. If it appears alien, so you get critiques of American imperialism, the emergence more and more of a police state under Obama, the ways in which he has a Wall Street government, the ways in which you got a black president, can't say a mumbling word about the new Jim Crow. Can you imagine having a black president in 1948 and all the Negroes get excited but he won't say a word about Jim Crow? I mean, you're only gonna dance for one night, you know what I mean? Or a black president during slavery and you celebrate for one night and he won't say a mumbling word about slavery, he just say, I'm president of everybody. And black folks say, we just ask them for justice. Right. Slavery is unjustly immoral and wrong. Jim Crow, unjustly immoral and wrong. New Jim Crow, prison industrial complex, dilapidated housing, disgraceful school systems, unemployment levels, depression-like, underemployment levels, depression-like. That's wrong, that's unjust. We're not asking for nothing special, we ask them for justice. That's the history of the black freedom movement. The history of it. So it's a matter of how do you shatter those kind of illusions? But we've got, you know, we black, we got a black middle class that uh, large numbers have been seduced. It's all about career. It's not about calling. It's all about ambition. It's not about vocation. It's about getting over. It's not about trying to be in solidarity with folk who are suffering. And see, when, when Martin Luther King called for revolution, because I'm a revolutionary Christian, just like I know we got revolutionary communists like Brother Carl Dix. And I love that brother, I know brother Steve is here too. And Black Agenda Report, you all are revolutionaries. Coming out of the Black Freedom Movement, you see. And we might have disagreements on some of these things, but the overlap is very real. And most importantly, we gotta keep it for real. The younger generation needs to have something real. They got superficial stuff bombarding them all the time, that thin stuff that cannot sustain you. And in fact, it's the mark of a healthy yes. community if they have disagreements. Yes. It means that you have ideas. Yes. It means that you care enough about that, those ideas to pick a fight with your comrades, with your brothers, with your neighbors, with members of your family about the direction that needs to be taken. Uh, I want to say something about journalism here. We're having a panel, and it's going to be a wonderful one, on journalism. I'm not in it, so I'm going to say my little thing <laughs> right now. Uh, peop people have no idea what journalism is today. It's, it's really news uh, reading. Uh, it's, it's really uh, being uh, a scribe 
for those in power. It has nothing uh, to do with, well, what I was brought up to think of journalism as. But journalism uh, addresses a, a fundamental question, and that is, what is important? If you control organs of journalism that can designate today what is important to talk about today, mm. that is about very powerful uh, and uh, significant uh, a central kind of mechanism to have. Uh, that's why even in the darkest days, uh, we feel uh, at Black Agenda Report that our duty uh, is to act as journalists and put out another issue that says, this is what is important. This is what's important to think about. Uh, and that does bring you into a clash with the black misleadership class. Uh, because uh, in, uh, according to their measurement, black progress uh, can be rated by how many black faces there are in high places. And it doesn't matter whether those black faces are doing any good for the rest of us. It is just that they are part of that firmament of, of black stars. And we're supposed to be content uh, and, in fact, happy uh, the more of those stars we see. Uh, but for the rest of us, we at Black Agenda Report believe uh, two of the most burning issues that face our people are mass black incarceration. The United States is the biggest uh, police state in the world by far, one out of every eight prison inmates on planet Earth are African American. A, a person from Mars uh, who orbited uh, our planet uh, just for two orbits, uh, and of course if they came from Mars they'd have instruments that could detect uh, well, just about everything. <laughs> Finding out that one out of eight prison inmates in the world was African American would pronounce the United States uh, effectively the most racist uh, uh, police state on earth, just by uh, the metrics. Uh, so quite, quite clearly, uh, that is supposed to be a top priority for, for any black political class. And yet, this black political class is more ashamed and embarrassed than outraged at the fact that one out of every eight prisoners on the planet uh, is African American. The other issue that we uh, uh, give a great deal of ink to is gentrification. Uh, gentrification is fundamental, it's not just white people moving in, that's just a symptom of gentrification. Gentrification is big capital staking out its ground in the cities and deciding how it's going to lay those cities out. And inevitably, that means that black folks have to go. Uh, but who have been uh, some of the main actors uh, facilitating gentrification? Black mayors. Uh, Bruce was talking about uh, this cast of characters who've been black mayors in Atlanta since 1972. They have facilitated uh, the decline uh, in the black majority in Atlanta. There will not be a black majority in Atlanta very, for very long. Washington, D.C. has lost its black majority. And that, that is because of policies uh, that came straight from the city halls that were uh, nominally controlled by black folks. So we have a, a black misleadership class that is so bankrupt in its policies, uh, so narrowly self-serving that they erode the same black majorities that put them in power. And, and, and if there is any testament to a, a bankruptness of politics, that is it. Mm. No, that, 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 that's very real, though. I mean, also, I would mention you all's critique of privatization of public education, which is so powerful in what you write about. Very, very important. Very, very important. We were just there at Wadley School. We said, well, they're they going to they close Wadley. They're going to take us to jail. On, on, here in Harlem. And that's just a, one small example, but a very significant one. PS123, the same thing. But all of them tied together to the issue of capitalism, the issue of empire. We should never forget one of the last conversations Brother Martin had. Harry Belafonte, Andrew Young was in the room. Martin had just met with Elijah Muhammad. He had just met with Mary Baraka. And he had just spoke at the anniversary for W.B. Du Bois and Carnegie Hall where well, only two, Brother Anthony, only two black intellectuals sh showed up. John Hope Franklin, he was shaking, he told me what he said because he was about to lose his job. But Martin King showed up and said, Du Bois is a genius and a communist. 
and I'm not a communist, but he's my brother. And I stand with him now because he's talking about a critique of capitalism. And when he was at Harry Belafonte's house, what did he say? He said, Andrew Young, the difference between me and you, we've been through hell and high water together many times. But the difference between me and you is that you believe in capitalism, I don't. And, Anthony, and, 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 and you know, Brother Young's my brother, he's just wrong on that issue. We got black mayors who believe. They believe the hype about capitalism. They believe the hype about free enterprise. And Martin King and the others just didn't. That's a fundamental fork in the road. And you have to make that fork, and when you cross that Rubicon, there's no way back. There's no way back. It doesn't necessarily make you a socialist or communist. All you're saying is, I love these people, and the system's not working for them. Something's wrong with this system. It's gangster-like. It's unaccountable, unanswerable, irresponsible, and some kind of fundamental change needs to be put forward. That's what Martin was saying. That's what makes him the kind of brother I love. Not that he's not flawed either, because of course he's a crack vessel like all lovers, and we learn from one another. But to raise that issue, capitalism, empire, patriarchy, homophobia, that's where we're headed. That's going to be the fork in the road. And it's not going to be a function of skin pigmentation at all. That's why I love my Haitian brothers and sisters. They know that. They know who, pay, who, 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 who baby doc was. They know who Papa Doc was. We love our African brothers and sisters. They've seen black African leaders sell their people down the river. That's not new. But for a lot of American black people, well, this skin pigmentation thing generates deep sense of solidarity. Depends on who it is. Depends on who it is. So that in the point that you're talking about, those two crucial issues, mass incarceration kind of thing Michelle Alexander talks about and Laquant and uh, Waquant and others, fundamental because if you deal with the new Jim Crow, if you deal with the least of these, that goes to the 25th chapter of Matthew, the prisoner, the orphan, the widow, the poor children, the workers, the marginalized, the Latinos dealing with moving borders and the immigration issue. If you look at America through that point of view, when we said we're about precious indigenous peoples, 1492, World War I began still going on this day. You see, that's the lens through which to understand the nation. That's where the truth's gonna come from, you see. And you see large numbers of Americans of all colors willing to be progressive, willing to tell that truth, and yet to be rooted, and I do believe in being, in being rooted. That's what I like, again, about Black Agenda Report. Now, you know, Black Agenda Report is not the only piece of journalism represented on this stage. You do uh, a huge portion of journalism yourself, because, you know, we have to wear many hats. Yeah, that's true. We've got to be have, improvisation on that. Oh, yeah. We, we are so lacking in institutions Jazz at this like. stage oh, yeah. in Black America that we got to wear all kinds of hats. No, so one of true. his hats uh, is, of course, the, uh, the Smiley and West show. And uh, I've heard that you're running into great obstacles with that. Yeah, yeah, it's been tough. And my dear brother, Tavis Smiley, I love my dear brother. He has a different formation than I do. He's Pentecostal, I'm Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a hang loose, cognac drinking, free Baptist. <laughs> but most importantly, he, hadn't, he, hadn't, he doesn't have the same kind of left formation. And so we end up with dialogues like this weekend we got uh, Bob Ovakian, the chairman of the Revolutionary Communist Party, very important voice as well even though I got my agreements and disagreements with Carl Dix and the others. We got a number of different progressives and we've more, we've got now listeners responding. They just shut our show down in Chicago. You see. Black but, market number two. But exactly, but, we, but the WVON now look like they're gonna respond. And the progressive radio, but this is public radio. They shut us down in Minneapolis, shut us down in St. Louis. They're trying to shut us down in Boston. That's a sign that you're doing something. Because it's a struggle. It's a contestation. Now, of course, Smiley and West, we're not as radical as Black Agenda Report. Well, let's, let's be honest about it. The Black Agenda Report has a consistency of radical analysis and radical praxis that me and Brother Tavis don't conform to. You all are just more, uh, you're more consistent, you know. 
Because uh, uh, Brother Tabas and I, we have a heterogeneity. He's my dear brother. I take a bullet from it, but we're not exactly the same space, even though he's been undergoing fascinating transformation. You see? And I come out of a tradition that is itself one that tries to be flexible, both fluid, the way you all are in your analysis, but also tries to ensure that even as I tell the truth, as my mother reminds me every day, as she receives vicious telephone calls, just as I get the death threats all the time the way you do, but I should have been dead a long time ago, so it don't make no difference to me, but I get worried about her. And she say, honey, make sure that you're not too alienated from the very people you're willing to help live and die for, that they understand why you're saying what you're saying. So that he won't just look at you and say, hater, that's what we get all the time. Y'all just hating. And that makes me want to fight. It does. Because when you love Jamal and Letitia on the corner, ain't got nothing to do with hate. It got something to do with hating injustice. Ain't got nothing to do with hating them. You hating Obama, ain't got nothing to do with hating Obama. It's hating his cowardliness, his complacency, his compliancy. I'm a Christian. I don't hate. I don't hate Michelle. I don't hate Sasha. I don't hate Malia at all. But I hate the use of persons to hide and conceal the suffering of those who are dealing with the incarceration you're all concerned about, the gentrification you're concerned about, the privatization you're concerned about. So it's a matter of then trying to reach out, you know, to the Steve Harveys and Tom Joyners and others who are spreading these kinds of vicious rumors. And I tell them, Negroes, when you are victimized by the same thing Letitia is, I'm going to stand with you. You just at the moment think you can get over. You at the moment think you can be indifferent. You at the moment think you can be distant from the suffering of them. And so in that sense, it's a matter of counter response. It's a fight back. But, it's, uh, but again, you're right, Smiley and Wes is, a, uh, is our effort. We've only had two years. We can't get one penny of sponsorship until it comes out of our own pocket. Just like the, the Poverty Tour number two came from our own pocket. Poverty the Poverty Tour number one came out of uh, both the pocket of our own pocket and the AARP and the NEA. That was, that, that, they were very supportive in that regard, you see. But I, mean, but, I, but I say that because you all have the same kind of challenge in terms of how do you sustain institutions in these days in which it's so difficult to gain a foothold, uh, to get some kind of support so you can continue to raise your voices. Very much so. I don't, I'm not sh quite sure how long we're going to be able to raise our voices. Yeah, no, uh, we want this, this wonderful so, panel. This wonderful so, panel we're so waiting for. I'd with. like someone to tell us how much time we have, but uh, I want to say something about, yes. about why we do yeah. what we do. Uh, and it, when we first started uh, Black Commentator, and that was back in 2002, uh, we immediately uh, got a, a huge amount of response in terms of people wanting uh, to send us articles. And, you know, a lot of these articles uh, were quite well written, uh, but they were coming from that aspiring black misleadership class. And, of course, we couldn't put them in there. And, and so we got then, uh, because we didn't uh, uh, give everybody uh, space in our new publication, uh, we, we got a lot of bad mail uh, saying, I thought this was supposed to be a forum for black people. Well, that, that went, uh, that was quite, an, this forum uh, idea was quite antithetical to our idea of what we should be uh, doing. Uh, what we thought was necessary uh, was to develop a political journal that actually argued about which direction folks should go, uh, and that argument uh, should, should be represented on the pages uh, of this publication, and we should actually uh, develop that argument and have a line so that people could uh, expect that when the burning issues of the day uh, arise, we would have an opinion and an analysis, uh, something worth reading uh, to say about it that we would be the, the opposite of a forum and a uh, catch-all and, and an eclectic kind of, of vehicle. We would be uh, really attempting uh, to 
to, to have a line, as, as they say. And as Bruce was alluding to in, in his talk, how did, we, how did this Black Agenda Report team evolve? It evolved because people who were actively involved in struggle, like uh, Bruce, uh, engaged us and said, no, this is the way to go. And he made his case. And uh, he convinced me uh, that this should have a, a th this should have an influence on the direction that the magazine was going to go. And then Margaret Kimberly writes a letter, and her analysis of Condoleezza Rice and her antics was just so beautiful. I said, "This has got to be, this has got to be part of this magazine." <laughs> and of course, in in the course of time, uh, we met uh, Marsha Coleman Adebayo because of her work. Uh, in the No Fear Coalition and then all those other things uh, that she does. And there, there was an organic relationship and she's Dr. Marsha Coleman out of bio and, and the uh, stuff she's doing on and an South excellent. Africa and other things, dying. So why should this brilliant uh, uh, activist uh, writer not be part of our team? And that's why she is a part of our team. And then we met uh, Jamima uh, Pierre. Uh, uh, who is in, in Dr. Jamima Pierre. Yes, uh, yes, and, yes. And Peter Hudson, uh, who do excellent work and are, are wonderful examples of what the black public intellectual should be. And we said, well, their place is in, and they agreed, is in Black Agenda Report. And, 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 and so we develop what we think uh, a black journalism should look like and how it should interact uh, with the struggling forces uh, out there. And, and yes, as a kind of role model uh, for others. But I'll tell you what we really believe uh, our, our, our central function is if we have no other function at all. And that is to show the flag, uh, mm -hmm. to show folk out there that there are still people uh, who uh, will speak truth to power. And if they feel like speaking truth to power and they think that all these organs that call themselves uh, journalism uh, are just servants of the enemy, uh, well, they're not crazy, because uh, we over here, and we think so too. <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. I know we just got a few minutes. See, the, the, my version of speaking truth to power is letting folk know, just like we went to jail for stopping frisk with Sister Nellie and the others, and we said right before the police dragged us off, we want these young folk to know that somebody loves them and willing to sacrifice for them, willing to go to jail and die for them. It's not just a matter of resisting the power structure. We're going to resist the power structure, but we're going to go, we're going to be passing off the scene pretty soon. We're going to pass it to the younger generation. And we are who we are because somebody loved us. Somebody was willing to sacrifice for us. You think I'm gonna be at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Union Theological Seminary about everyday people willing to engage in rebellion and shake the foundations of white supremacist civilization in the 1960s? Negroes been smart for a long time, but they don't end up in those kind of mainstream institutions. Folk were willing to sacrifice. That's what love is. And when you speak the truth, it's both the power, but it's also the truth to the relatively powerless to wake them up, quit your sleepwalking, straighten up your back, organize, mobilize, be part of the best of your history. And so it goes both ways in that way. And the Black Agenda Report were read the way Ebony Magazine is read. Can you imagine the level of awakening and the tide to courage and vision and organizing and mobilizing? If we had musicians, that were like Nina Simone, rather than some of these hip artists whose name I won't mention, Lil Wayne and some of these other Negroes. <laughs> and I love Lil Wayne. His reflection on New Orleans, serious. Lollipop, no, that ain't me. <laughs> but it's that kind of renaissance that we're talking about. And that's why I, you know, in my own way as a lover, because I'm not a fan of a Black Agenda Report, I'm a lover of Black Agenda Report. I'm a participant. And we need to take this all around the country, every city, raise money, dialogue, reflect, think about what's going on, realize the folk who loved you, keep the love train going, come together and have the contestation and so forth. 
Not just on religious issues, sometimes on politics, sometimes on strategy, but in the end, we tied to a cause because black freedom is the leaven in American life. When black freedom expands, it expands for everybody. It's not a special interest group. It's about justice, steadfast commitment to the well-being of poor and working people. That's what the tradition's about. And that's why Black Agenda Report is not just indispensable. It is becoming more and more the precondition for any serious talk about de democratizing possibilities in the USA. And that's why I'm so blessed to be here. I'm losing my voice, my brother. Not but I'm just so blessed to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, this part is just about at an end. I, I have to admit something. I'm a little bit ashamed. Uh, when Alexander Coburn uh, passed away, uh, we didn't, uh, well, we didn't dedicate any space uh, in our publication. And, and, and that's, that's not just something to be shamed about uh, as, as, a, uh, as, as a magazine, but I personally am uh, ashamed uh, because I was a friend of, of Alexander uh, Coburn. Uh, but more than that, uh, in many ways, Alexander Coburn uh, uh, was my idol uh, in terms of being a writer. Uh, so we, we wanted uh, to pay a tribute uh, to him uh, this evening, uh, uh, not just not to make up for that, uh, but to say, say something uh, at, in this special kind of place uh, where folk will know what we're talking about when we say Alexander Coburn. Uh, I, I, I was amazed, I was enthralled, I, I, was, I was fascinated when I came to, uh, to New York in, in the late uh, 70s from, from DC uh, to find his byline uh, in, in the Village Voice under a thing called Press Clips. A and Press Clips uh, was supposed to be, in terms of its genre, uh, just a kind of uh, throwaway uh, staple uh, of, of, of the Village Voice, the, the kind of thing that was a he said or she said, this is what the Daily News said, and this is what the New York Times said, and this is uh, what some uh, unworthy uh, r rich person uh, said. It was just, just the, the, the usual nonsense. But in Alexander Coburn's hands, uh, it became a forum for him to skewer the Daily News and skewer the New York Times and shove it all the way up uh, these, these rich, unworthy uh, people's nether regions. And, and, and it, but it wasn't just that he decided that that's what I'm going to do with this blasé little uh, uh, column, which was worth the price of, uh, of the Village Voice. It was a dollar uh, a, a copy at that time. Uh, but he did it with such style and flair and, and humor. Uh, he would massacre uh, the enemy, really beat the devil, and he would never break into a sweat. And I knew that this had something to do uh, with his being from the British Isles, and I could never and would not want to ever aspire to be from the British Isles, <laughs> but I wanted to be like him. Uh, uh, to confront power and defeat it, at least on that terrain of the page, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, seemingly effortless, effortlessly, uh, so that the, the end result, the, the net effect, is to make those who are powerful look ridiculous. And the reader then emerges and says, not only are these people not what they say they are, but they are not even deserving of respect. And so Alexander Coburn uh, gets my, and, and, and the whole Black Agenda team, I believe, feels similarly, uh, eternal uh, respect. And so can we uh, give him 30 I think, I think that Alexander Coburn would think 30 seconds of silence was excessive. Let's give him 10 seconds and, and he'll think better of us. We're going to bring up Glenn Ford again. And for those of you who got here late or don't know, he's the executive editor 
of Black Agenda Report, and he is going to introduce the premiere of Black, uh, Black Agenda TV, and we have uh, a, uh, a clip in an episode for you, part of that episode, and he is going to introduce uh, that film to you. So I welcome again Glenn Fort, the executive editor of Black Agenda Report. Thank you, Mother. And thanks to the artist, uh, uh, I think a great man named Cornel West once said uh, that the revolution will not be televised, but it will have a soundtrack. So, so that was a cut from the soundtrack. Uh, this event is not just because we're six years old and like to have a party. Uh, and uh, it is because we needed some money from y'all, but that wasn't the only reason we invited you. We wanted you guys to see uh, something that we've been building uh, towards for a long time, but we're finally pushed uh, uh, to actually accomplish this project uh, by Roy Singham, who's in the audience. Could you please stand up? If it was not for Roy, and I'm speaking in many, many ways, uh, his encouragement uh, and enthusiasm, uh, there would be no Black Agenda uh, television. Uh, and so uh, he is, he's really the executive producer, in a sense, uh, of this. Uh, but if it were not for the fact that we found a wonderful and politically compatible uh, team uh, working out of Jersey City, uh, that is Black Wax, uh, then we wouldn't be able We wouldn't have been able to, to bring this off either, so I want to call attention to Ayanna Jones, who you will see uh, uh, early on uh, in this production, uh, you Savior, uh, and Shauna. Shauna's the person running around with the camera, so she's going to document all of this, which will probably show up in some future episode of Black Agenda Television. We will be going on a regular schedule uh, uh, very, very shortly, and we'll keep all of you apprised uh, as to uh, when that might be. This is 28 minutes long. Uh, it is uh, not a pilot. Uh, it, that is, it would be what you would see uh, if we were to air it uh, uh, today. And we will be having it aired on uh, various platforms very soon. And we need some laughs with these clowns who are running for president, don't we? All right, folks, we're going to bring on the next uh, panel. Uh, that is being uh, moderated by Margaret Kimberly. The panelists are going to take their place on the stage and I am going to turn the mic over to Margaret who will introduce uh, her panel and her panelists. Thank you very much, Nellie. Thank you all. This has been such a wonderful evening to be at my, uh, my former church and to find one of my neighbors playing the piano. Um, I knew Donnie was a musician, but all these years we've lived in the same building and taken out our recycling together. I've never heard him perform, so that's a special treat for me. We, um, the reason we're here tonight, as, uh, as Glenn and others have said, is uh, not just to celebrate our, uh, our birthday, our anniversary, but it's to talk about journalism. And uh, the title of our uh, panel discussion is Black Journalists' World-Changing Mission, uh, with a very distinguished group of speakers who I'm uh, about to introduce. introduce. Um, there is no reason to, uh, to be here to have this sixth anniversary celebration if we don't talk about black journalism and the role it plays in changing the world. Um, now all of our panelists are not African Americans, which we, won't, we don't hold against them and we're sure um, <laughs> that they will be uh, uh, able to uh, join our conversation because everyone here is a friend. Uh, everyone here uh, understands our mission and uh, actively promotes it. So we thank every, everyone. Um, I'm going to just uh, get moving and not in any order here, just in the order that I have uh, the uh, bios of our speakers. 
uh, Jamima Pierre, right here. Uh, she's an editor and columnist for Black Agenda Report, and she's a professor of anthropology and African American and diaspora studies at Vanderbilt University. Now, she gave this very brief bio, um, selling herself short, I think, but she's a very powerful writer, a very powerful speaker. Uh, Marsha Coleman Adebayo uh, is uh, famous for uh, being one of the uh, most, most famous whistleblowers in the country. She held a very high position at the uh, EPA for many years uh, until she blew the whistle on a, a multinational corporation's um, deadly mining practices in South Africa and later won a, an historic lawsuit against that agency. And she's a regular contributor to Barr and is still an advocate and leader uh, for uh, whistleblowers around the country. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, Richard Wolf is a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he's currently a visiting professor in the graduate program and in international affairs at the New School University in New York. He's published many books, articles, and newspaper columns, and hosts uh, the weekly economic update program on WBAI. Bruce Dixon. Now, his, his bio on Barr says he's a habitual troublemaker and incorrigible activist. So I'll just stick with that. And as he said, a native Chicagoan. Uh, he's worked for many years community organizing, as he said, in many political campaigns. And he's also an, uh, an excellent writer uh, and speaker. Anthony Montero, who we've uh, seen in our video, is a distinguished lecturer in uh, African American Studies and an associate director of the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Thought at Temple University, where he teaches on African Ameri and American social and political thought. And he's well known for his work on uh, studying uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, we're joined by Mr. Palagumi Sanath from India. He's uh, India's foremost journalist, and we're very pleased to have him with us this evening. It's a great honor for him to be here. So we will uh, we'll just get started as the, the hour is getting a little later. And we're just going to start. We'll go in, in order, uh, if that's OK with you, Mr. Professor Montero. Oh, sure. Well, how long do we have? Three minutes. Three minutes, Three minutes. good, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, good to be here. I mean, you know, um, just taking off from what Glenn and uh, Cornell were talking about uh, in relationship to journalism, uh, journalism ultimately is a moral profession. Uh, the left is probably today uh, the moral conscience of this nation. Uh, so if you don't have a moral conscience, you would feel comfortable not being on the left and attacking the left. Uh, just, just a quick thing, you know, um, being in this church and uh, you can't come in here without feeling the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. and that great time to break silence speech. And when you think about Martin Luther King, if you know anything about his education, you know, you're taken back uh, to Nazi Germany and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And if we don't know that name, we should know that name, and the anti-Nazi church of Germany. Um, we talk about liberation theology. I think uh, we're going to have to up the stakes. We're going to have to begin to talk about anti-fascist theology. And really, um, at some point, we're going to have to think about the formation uh, of the anti-Nazi church of the black community as the moral center of, of the uh, black community. Okay. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you all for, for coming and, and helping Bar celebrate. Um, my, my approach to blackness has always been one that's global. And so this is the worldview that has guided my uh, contributions to Bar. Um, my, my columns generally focus on um, the themes of 
the impact of the U.S. imperialism on Haiti and in Africa, um, as well as the need to continue working um, on a pan-African project for global black emancipation. And so to do this, I, I think, requires to, uh, us to go back to the long tradition of black radical politics and journalism um, that we had um, in the past, that has been you know, completely obliterated in the past um, 20 years or so, I think. Um, some examples, you know, during the 1915 to 1934 occupation, um, military occupation of Haiti by the US, you had W.E. Du Bois who used the column, the column of the crisis to actually, um, as a platform to rally the U U.S. blacks against the country's imperialism. You had the NAACP send James Weldon Johnson, its field secretary, to Haiti to do research and to document the atrocities that the Marines were doing, um, were, uh, were committing against Haitians um, during that time. And so in William, um, James Weldon, D Weldon Johnson came back and wrote a number of articles, really searing articles in the nation, in the crises, in the, in the crisis, really um, talking about what was going on. And I think it was the work of African American radical leaders and journalists who actually changed American attitudes on the occupation and imperialism. And I think we need to you know, think about that even as times are changing, right? Times have changed where once black folks um, academics and journalists once actively challenged imperialism, today more than happy to support a black commander in chief. And our engagement with Africa and the African diaspora is actually through this empire in black face. And so what we need to do is to fight against this. And as far as I'm concerned, um, the black left journalism mission is to, um, is to get back to that work. You know, so what we need is a reinvigorated public discourse that is led by a black anti-imperialist journalism. And, and we need to get back to critical analysis on AFRICOM, MINISTER, the land grabs, the recolonization of the African continent, um, et cetera. And I think Black Agenda Report is one of the few venues, it's the only venue, um, that's able to sustain this moral tradition and radical critique that began over 100 years ago. So one of the, what the other final thing I wanted to say, just in terms of black journalism, is the idea that we need to actually think outside the US, right, and build broad alliances with our Caribbean and African brothers and sisters that are, you know, that are you know, bearing the brunt of US imperialism. And I think African Americans used to have this moral high ground when it came to um, US imperialism, and I think we've lost it in the age of Obama. And so we need this reinvigorated pan-Africanist news agency, and I think Black and Gender Report should provide us with the beginnings of you know, this reinvigoration as a platform um, to stand on. Thank you. Uh, I may be the person that she was referring to before as not being African American. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for bringing me and inviting me and giving me a chance to express my own appreciation from my corner for the Black Agenda Report. Uh, I have uh, the good fortune to talk with Glenn Ford from time to time about economics and to see that uh, we agree on so much and that it finds its way in there. So from that standpoint about the economics, which I know about, I want to say a few words. The first is to pick up on what several of you said about the importance of speaking truth to power. And the uh, Black Agenda Report certainly does that. But there's always a caution with that statement that I learned from my father, who looked at me once when I had repeated once too often about how important it was to speak truth to power. He looked at me with that grin he had and said, be very careful because that might leave you with the truth and them with the power and that you have always to go another step. You speak truth to power, but you have to organize to confront and overcome that power, or else you'll forever be left with the right opinions and the good understanding, but. So I think there's a crucial step to becoming a real movement for change in the left. And that has to do with confronting the economic system that we have, that so many on the left of, from all the communities have hesitated to do. To give that system the name it deserves, capitalism, 
and to say that when that system breaks down, when it does not deliver the goods, which it hasn't done for a long time, and especially in the last five years, it is the job of the left to remind people that this is a system like all the systems that preceded it, that was born, that evolved, and whose time may have come to die. And that we therefore need to look for alternatives and not be shouted down that we have to accept the basic economic system, whatever our politics. The remarkable thing that the Black Agenda Report does and that few others on the left although I note that the Occupy Wall Street movement was very courageous in beginning to say that also. We're finally coming, we're finally coming out, as other speakers, and as, as the television clip said so well, we're coming out of a period of losing our way. For 50 years it was not possible in the United States in general to be critical of capitalism except for a tiny group. That once was, the basis for a powerful movement. It can be again. And the left cannot avoid confronting that capitalism is at its own turning point. Let me end with a story that I think illustrates this. Over the last few weeks and months, for the first time in a long time, workers at the largest single private employer in the United States, Walmart, have done some courageous strikes and demonstrations. What is Walmart? Walmart is a kind of quintessential emblem of the United States. A company that went from a small department store in Arkansas 50 years ago to the largest single employer in the United States. It employs over 2 million people around the world. It does $440 billion a year worth of business. It's a stupefyingly large corporation. The six heirs, the six children of Mr. Walton, together own something on the order of $80 billion in assets. That's the amount of wealth owned by the bottom 30% of the United States. Six families own the same wealth as 100 million American citizens. That's the achievement of capitalism. Absurd wealth at one end, and an army of the worst paid people, basically, of any major corporation, the average take home pay of an associate, they don't call them workers, an associate at Walmart is $10 an hour. That puts you below the poverty line. The great achievement of capitalism, absurd wealth at one end, and mass poverty at the other. That's what a left can and should say. That's what the majority of people will respond to if agencies like the Black Agenda Report and the others that think like that and are inspired by that, that's the basis for building the movement that can not only speak truth to power, but change the power as well. And so my hat goes off, as do many of us, for the work that Black Agenda Report has done and is continuing to do to move in that direction. It's very, very important for all of us. Bruce Dixon. All right. Um, I've been asked to talk about black journalism a couple of times before, and um, I got bad news. Uh, they say Mahatma Gandhi was once asked what he thought about Western civilization, and he said he thought it would be a good idea. Well, that's the way I feel about black journalism. It would be a good idea. You know, if you go to the website of the Atlanta Daily World today, which is supposedly the Atlanta black newspaper, and Atlanta's the second largest concentration of black folks on this continent, you will find maybe 11 or 12 stories. Um, the last time I looked, I think uh, three or four of them were ripped straight from wire service copy, from AP copy. Um, another three or four of them were entertainment news. One would have been a sports story, and the rest would have been press releases from local colleges and local government. Uh, journalism, period, doesn't exist, and it's not the Internet's fault either. Don't believe that one. Okay, that's, you know, what they say. The reason journalism doesn't exist or barely exists is because in this country, corporations have decided that you don't need to be informed. 
It's just that simple. So there are few ways for journalists to make money. Brother Tavis Smiley, the ladder he climbed up is gone. Young journalists can't climb that ladder anymore. Um, I've, I've, I've spoke to journalism students, and most of them are going to uh, work for PR firms now. Uh, because there are few jobs in journalism, and those that are going to get jobs in journalism are, like Alexander Coburn once said, already writing for their prospective bosses. So we've got to find some ways to actually put that on the list of things that we're struggling for. Uh, a Second Amendment means nothing if nobody can make a living writing anything, and nobody can make a living telling you any news. And so that needs to be on the list of things uh, that we're struggling for. So um, that's my three minutes, and thank you. <laughs> Marsha Coleman Adebayo. Dr. Uh, Coleman Adebayo. Thank you so much. I first wanted to acknowledge uh, a small contention here from Maryland. Uh, so please let me acknowledge um, Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zees. Uh, they ran Occupy Washington, D.C. <laughs> And they also provided a safe place for uh, the No Fear Coalition to organize Occupy EPA. And we actually occupied the grounds of EPA on four occasions uh, while we had our encampment uh, at Freedom Plaza. So I'm very happy to be here. I also want to acknowledge my son, who's here as well, Olushida Adebayo. Um, I was in a small bookstore a couple of months ago. Did you hold this for me? And I ran across a really uh, fabulous little pamphlet. Uh, it's called The Responsibility of Intellectuals. And it's, uh, it was written by Noam Chomsky. And uh, he wrote this, uh, this uh, small article uh, in, spring, uh, in the spring of 1966. Uh, at that time, it cost 25 cents. And I should tell you, I bought it for $10, uh, <laughs> which talks a little bit about um, inflation. Um, but, but he has one sentence here that I wanted to share with you. He says, intellectuals are in a position to expose the lies of governments, to analyze actions in terms of their causes and motives and often hidden intentions. I think that's really important because what Noam is calling us to do is to blow the whistle. And that is really what we must all, I think, engage in. Um, whether you're a journalist or whether you're working uh, in a workplace, our goal is to blow the whistle because corruption in this country is so entrenched and it's so dense that you need, not have, you need not go very far to find corruption in this country. The question that we all must, that we all must answer and the, the question, the issue that we all face is will we blow the whistle? And so my articles for BAR have focused on my role as an EPA whistleblower. Um, I was the EPA representative to the Nelson Mandela government on the issue of the environment when the Mandela government came to power. And my job was to work with the new Mandela government uh, to make sure that they understood some of the lessons that we had learned in the environmental movement in the United States and to transfer information and technology as needed. I found out that a US multinational corporation uh, was poisoning a community in South Africa that mined vanadium pentoxide. Now you may ask, what is vanadium pentoxide? And I'll tell you, it's, it's somewhat, it's, 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 a, it's a substance um, that's, that's buried deep in the Earth's crust, but more importantly, what is it used for? The CIA considers vanadium pentoxide a strategic mineral. Why? Because vanadium is the alloy that's mixed with steel that allows steel to have its flexibility to, um, to, to expand when exposed to hot and cold conditions. That's the reason why the steel in your car does not crack when it goes from summer to winter. That's the reason why you can take a spoon 
and have hot soup and then use it in ice cream. It's in the cameras, it's in the lighting, it is in everything that has steel. And Western society is built on an infrastructure of steel, of steel. And a small community in South Africa mines vanadium pentoxide. And we receive 80% of our vanadium pentoxide from this small community. But I'll tell you, vanadium pentoxide is very toxic. And within six months of coming in contact with vanadium pentoxide, miners are, are functionally uh, impotent. After a while, their tongues start to turn a bright, a bright green, which indicates kidney and liver failure. And they develop cancers, and they start bleeding from every orifice of their body. And when I went to the White House and to EPA, and told them what I had found out, I was given the order to stand down and to shut up. And I had a decision to make. Was I going to look the other way, or was I going to tell the truth? And I decided that I was going to blow the whistle. And Barr has really given me the opportunity to blow the whistle on a regular basis. And as many of you know, chapters of my book have been running in Barr, which is No Fear, Whistleblower's Triumph. So I'm very grateful to be here. I did want to blow the whistle on one issue before I turn um, uh, the mic over to my colleague. And that is that the, that the EPA is very similar to the rest of the federal government. The federal government is a very um, oppressive and, uh, and repressive institution. And if you dare blow the whistle, the foot that is placed on your neck usually breaks most people. But in the past, in the past, the most whistleblowers had to confront when they, when they blew the whistle in the federal government is that they would lose their job and never work again because, of course, at that point, you're blackballed. But now they have a very insidious strategy in the federal government. And now it's something that I call workplace to prison pipeline. Because now, I know we have the school to prison pipeline. Now we have a workplace to prison pipeline. Because if you dare blow the whistle in the federal government, they will send you to prison. And we are now dealing with three black women who blew the whistle, not even knowing, because most whistleblowers don't know they're blowing the whistle. You find out that there's a problem, you report it, thinking that everyone's going to congratulate you, not realizing that this is an endemic, corrupt situation, and now they're, you know, basically your neck is on the block. And now these women are all facing federal prison terms. So the strategy has changed, the noose is tightening, and the government is determined, particularly the Obama administration, because we've never experienced anything like we've experienced under the Obama administration in terms of whistleblowers going to prison. So this is a very serious situation. And um, look, for, look for an article in bar from me on this particular <laughs> issue. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Samath, welcome. You know, I, I think we'd all agree that much of what we call journalism is essentially stenography and stenography to power. There has been, to go back to what Professor Montero said, in, in a sense, a shift in the moral universe of the media driven by corporate power. And that actually has um, sad to say, strengthened deeply. We had, before I left India, there was this seminar in Delhi on the rat race in the media. I didn't have much to say because the rat race in the media is over. The rats have won. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but good journalism in general and radical journalism in particular will always be judged by how we cover the great processes of our time, how we relate to those processes and the movements coming out of them, and how we tell the story through the lives of ordinary, everyday people. These three things, I think, are, as a working journalist, I would think this, these are the tasks before us. Um, if you look, what are those great processes anyway? I think 
the giant canvas on which we can locate most of these processes in our time is the astonishing and growing inequality worldwide. Okay? And uh, the, the race for resources, the dispossession, the hunger that has come about in the last 25 years as a result of that race for resources, the neoliberal processes of globalization. Just one thing, a little aside. The Arab Spring was not sparked by Google and Twitter. It was sparked by unprecedented levels of rise in food prices. <laughs> Most of these stories never once told you that Egypt was at that point, A, the biggest importer of wheat in the world. Not India, not China, Egypt was the biggest importer of wheat in the world. Nor were you told that the uprisings in the Arab countries were preceded by earlier risings in the same countries in 2008 when food prices went up. And the 2010-11 uprising came at the end of a year where Fortune ranked food companies in the world as number one in profit and number four in revenue in the Fortune list of companies growing fastest. The 100 companies growing fastest, food companies were, linked, were rated as number one in profit, number four in revenue, and the number one of all of them was Archer Daniels Midland. In India, which has produced 48 dollar billionaires, which is more than all, which is two and a half times the number of dollar billionaires of all the Scandinavian and Nordic countries put together, we have, an of, we have official data showing us that 836 million people survive on less than 50 cents a day. Okay? Second, the same country that has produced, surely you saw that headline a few months ago, the collapse in the power grid left 600 million people without power for a day. Now, where I was, I'm a rural journalist, I spend most of my time in the countryside, that was a joke, the headline, because 300 of those 600 million people never ever had electricity. <laughs> the, only news, the only newspaper in the world that got the headline right was Onion, was The Onion, which said, 300 remain plunged in darkness as power returns to India. <laughs> now, you've had, you've had an increasing disconnect. But as the corporatization grows, you've had a disconnect between journalist, journalism and media and public in a manner where if you look at it, whether it's in the United States or in India, or many beats, almost all those beats that a journalist did associated with ordinary people, those have disappeared. The farm beat, the labor beat, how many labor correspondents exist now? You won't find a full-time labor correspondent anywhere. An education correspondent is somebody who covers college, not primary school. Okay? So all the beats relating to ordinary people have disappeared and as a result, we have an astonishing situation that in the last, since 1995, which is the most intense period of India's globalization, a quarter of a million farmers have committed suicide in the drive towards corporate farming. The official figure of the government of India is 270,000. What stories have you ever read about that? Now, the one thing that I want to you know, finish this comment on is, it's not just the responsibility of journalists to, to tackle journalism, to deliver good journalism, to change the world. They can be part of that process, and in fact, if they start thinking that they are carrying the world on their shoulders, I see all kinds of problems ahead. <laughs> but it's also the responsibility of every one of you who belly aches about the media, if you are not supporting financially at least three journals like Bar, if you're not putting your money there to support those kind of journals that take that trouble to put that data in your sphere, to put that information in the public domain, you have no right to complain. Thank you. Thank you. I think it works. This works. I think it's done. We, we don't have much time, but I, I would like to ask uh, each of our uh, panelists a question. Hopefully you can answer it in, a, in one minute. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Montero, you've uh, done uh, a lot of study of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. 
who, and I'm thinking of him as we uh, have a presidential election in a few weeks, and he declared, I believe it's the 1956 election, he was not going to participate, he was not going to vote. Can you talk about that for a minute and, and what that means for us today? In a minute, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Well, that's what he said, and uh, that's what he did. And he said it in 1952, and I don't even think he was in the country in 1960. Uh, he, he had concluded uh, that uh, the United States, in terms of its political regime, was uh, rapidly ceasing to be a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an inconvenient truth that we, on the left, and we, the American people, are going to have to face. And after we face up to that fact, we then have to ask ourselves, what is to be done? Thank you. <laughs> um, Professor Pierre, uh, you spoke uh, about uh, uh, Haiti. If you could wave a magic wand, if you could uh, get journalists to write something about Haiti, I know there's so many things, what, do you, what would you most like Americans to know? Well, the first thing I'd like is that phrase, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere should be banished from every news <laughs> report on Haiti. Because what's, what I want people to know is Haiti has been under military occupation since 2004, enforced by George W., you know, initiated by George W. Bush, who took out an elected president and then enforced by Obama, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and Obama was behind the sham elections um, that we had a, a year and a half ago, and people don't know this. And so, mm -hmm. so one of the, what, two things is, you know, this idea that Haiti is under military occupation, and then the other is that Obama has facilitated the return of a neo-duvalierist, -duval you know, um, um, uh, leadership that's about to become a dictatorship very, very quickly. And, um, and I think, I think the, the last column I wrote was, you know, don't blame Republicans for mm -hmm. Obama's actions in Haiti. And part of that was to really point out that, you know, it's not Republican intransigence that's keeping Haiti under the yoke of U.S. imperialism. It's actually our black emperor that's mm -hmm. keeping the first black nation under U the yoke of U.S. imperialism. Thank you. Professor Wolf, we, um, a few days ago there was uh, much noise made about the unemployment rate and that it was below 8% for the first time in months. And this was good news for the president and so on and so forth. What is the true unemployment rate in the country? Well, let me answer it this way. First, to make sure everybody understands what's at stake with unemployment. This is an economic system which now, and I'll explain in a minute what it means, has about 20 to 25 million people that are unemployed. Alongside that, according to the Federal Reserve, one-fifth, 20% of the tools, equipment, raw materials, office, factory, and store space is sitting idle. We have an economic system that has 25 million people who want a job. We have all the tools and equipment and raw materials they could possibly want to work with. If we put these two things together, the output could, output could transform this society. But we live in an economic system called capitalism that can't get that job done. It is the single most profound critique of the inefficiency of this economic system and its social cost that I can think of. Now the specific answer. The Bureau of Labor Statistics in Washington keeps these records. And the records bounce up and down. They're based on surveys. They have lots and lots of problems. It's well known by the people who pay attention to this stuff that with a little bit of effort, you can tweak the numbers up and down any given month or two, and nothing should be made of those numbers on any particular month. The major number used by most economists is called U-6. It's one of the many unemployment statistics the government keeps. U-6 measures the number of people looking for work who can't find it. The number of people who are looking for work who've given up looking and aren't looking anymore, they're called in our government statistics, you'll love this, discouraged workers. <laughs> and the third group measured by U-6 are people who want a full-time job 
but can't find it and have to have a part-time job. 20 to 25 million people are in that situation. That's way more than when this crisis began. So whenever you hear the term recovery, you're listening to someone who's about to sell you a very bad used car. And don't pay attention. We haven't even gotten halfway back to where we were before this crisis started. For five years, this president, as the one before, has appealed to the private sector to hire people. That appeal failed. In a rational universe, if you fail for five years in a row, you try something else. <laughs> the alternative would be a government employment program the way Roosevelt did in the 1930s and hired 12 million people. The genius of our system is that neither Mr. Obama nor Mr. Romney ever discusses a public employment program when it's the obvious solution our own history teaches us. Unemployment is a tragedy, a catastrophe of capitalism. It's not necessary. It's not what the people want. It's an indictment of a system. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, you talked about uh, uh, corporations deciding that we don't really need to know much. And uh, talk about the, the debate commission. I know you, you wrote oh, briefly dear, um, about the debate commission and the, the corporatization of that. Go ahead. Uh, let me see. I, I think I'll channel what Mr. Z said uh, the other day. He said the, corp the presidential debate commission is a corporation. Uh, it's it's uh, leading personalities are from the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. And uh, of course, they're their mission is to make sure that nobody else gets on the debate. They change the, they manipulate the qualification rules for um, who can be on presidential debates to ensure that. Um, before this presidential debate uh, commission took over that task, uh, for a few years it was run by the League of Women Voters. And uh, the League of Women Voters came under intense criticism because uh, they would not allow the moderators to be chosen, they would not allow uh, the questions to be chosen, um, and so that's why we've got this debate commission. This debate commission, like I said, allows moderators to be chosen by the two parties, it allows the questions to be chosen by the two parties, it allows the format to be chosen by the two parties, and it allows the location and number of debates to be chosen by the two parties. So it's just one more manifestation of what uh, Brother Tony up there said, is that the political system of this country is largely people-proof and democracy-proof. And uh, there it is. Uh, it's time to wake up and smell whatever this is that's cooking. <laughs> If, uh, uh, Marsha, the, uh, the, what you just told us about whistleblowers now actually uh, being imprisoned, facing jail, or actually being jailed, is there anyone uh, writing about, this is the first time I've, I've heard of this, I consider myself a well-informed person, but this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Is there any, aside from you and Barr, is there anywhere else that we can uh, find this information? Um, sure. Please go to the uh, National Whistleblower Center, www.nwc.org. Um, they have a tab that you can click on, and you can find out more about incarcerated whistleblowers. I mean, one of the things that I'll say is that there is one thing that both Democrats and Republican presidents uh, agree on, is that they both hate whistleblowers. It's incredible. Whether you're a Democrat or a presidential candidate, Democratic president, Republican, the one thing they agree on is that they don't want anyone around them who will tell the truth. And so for that reason, whistleblowers have become enemy number one, particularly inside the government itself. Um, also, you could go, there are a number of uh, GAP, Government Accountability Project, also has information on incarcerated whistleblowers. Um, I'll tell you, that what's, what's really sad in many ways about the incarceration of whistleblowers is that there was a man who was incarcerated as a result 
of testifying in my case, as you said, I went to, to federal court, and I'm one in, uh, there are only 2% only of us win when we go to federal court. 98% of all the cases are thrown out or dismissed or they lose in front of a jury. Um, but I was, I felt, I saw I'm a two percenter in that sense. And so I fell in the two percent. And a, a, a man who I did not know stepped forward to testify that he, did, he had heard certain things in my case. And we thought it was over. I mean, I won and uh, we thought that his life was going to be just fine. And the federal government, once he testified in my case, they started adding a little bit of money in his direct deposit account. Because in the federal government, our money goes directly from Treasury into our bank account. So he had nothing whatsoever to do with the money that was being deposited in his account. Six years later, they, they, they waited. Six years, they wrote him a letter and said, you know, we've made a mistake. For some reason, we've overpaid you by eighty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. How do you intend to take care of this problem? He said, well, just take it out the way you put it in. He never <laughs> thought for a second that the government was trying to set him up. So he signed a letter allowing them to take out the money every month. The next thing, he received a letter from the Department of Justice saying that he was, being, he was, he was, he was under investigation for defrauding the United States government. And his name is John Grant. If you go to my website, you'll see uh, um, sort of a bonus chapter by John Grant called Letter from an Indiana Federal Prison. They sent John Grant to prison for six months. He was in solitary confinement for a month. So this is, so, so the federal government is sending out a very loud and clear message to whistleblowers inside the federal government. If you blow the whistle, it may take us six years, it may take us seven years, but we will get you and you will go to jail. So now we're beginning to see a pattern of whistleblowers going to jail. And you probably read a couple weeks ago about a whistleblower who blew the whistle on, I think it was inside trading. Um, and in fact, the federal government has just paid him $100 million. You probably read about that in the New York Times a couple weeks ago. Well, it's interesting because he went to prison two years before he received payment of $100 million. And in fact, he is still under house arrest with an with a ankle chain around his neck, around his ankle right now. Even though he's going to receive a check for $100 million, he is still incarcerated in his home. So, um, so these are chilling messages that the federal government is sending. So when you talk about fascism, you know, in, in terms of governmental abuse, this is exactly what we're talking about. Yes. Thank you. And lastly, but not least, we, um, uh, India is always described to Americans as the, the world's largest democracy. Um, but in the face of, uh, as we see here in the United States, such gross inequality, um, uh, such great corruption, what kind of democracy can you really, can you really have? It really depends on which strata of society you belong to. Now, if you are in the top 10, 20 percent of Indian society, you have, you have very much a functioning democracy for you. Mm -hmm. If you are at the bottom 20, 30 percent, then that's a very different story. So it's, uh, secondly, it is essentially a very thriving, successful electoral democracy. I think mm -hmm. our elections are much better than yours. Oh. Uh, but when you move away from the electoral aspect of democracy to different kinds of rights, especially socio-economic rights and how they are observed in practice, then there's a giant section of the population which does not access or enjoy that democracy. But in, in, term, in broad terms of a functioning electoral democracy where you get to vote and people actually change governments, mm -hmm. they do very frequently. Uh, that, that exists. But, uh, you know, if it depends on the region you belong to, the caste and the class you belong to. Uh, now, if you belong to one of the lowest sections of Indian society, even all the laws are there to protect you. The constitution defends you. But simply the act of accessing a court can be made impossible. 
There are seven, I, I once did a thing on a Dalit goes to, to court. What happens when a Dalit, a so-called untouchable, go, tries to go to court? There are seven barriers he or she faces before they can even reach a courtroom. So if you want to look at democracy in that sense, then we're talking about a very different system of governance. Yes. Sounds familiar. <laughs> well, I, you know, we could, I know we're, we're wrapping up now. Uh, we could go on and on. You've been such a great panel, and I thank you all uh, for uh, making this such a wonderful evening. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. We are going to ask members of the panelists to step down. We are closing now. It's uh, the witching hour is upon us. We would like to ask Dr. West to join us. And also, Randy, if you could just, no, we're just going to do a little group togetherness here. If you could just step down and Ms. Adebayo, if you could uh, just join us here. We're going to ask uh, Dr. Cornell West if we could take a group photo, and Randy Credico, uh, if you are still in the house, and Glenn Ford. Um, and we are going to be um, taking out uh, the evening here. Uh, as we say good night to all of you, um, with uh, Glenn Ford and everyone. Uh, pardon me? Please, please. Uh, we're going to ask Ms. Uh, Tilivu Kummerbatch to take us out with a couple of bars of The Creator Has a Master Plan. We want to thank all of you and most of all Riverside Church. Colleen Pinto, if you are in the house, rah, rah, hello. How can we ever thank you for all of the support that you've given us? Uh, we want to also say thank you to Roy. Of course, uh, to Roy Singham, uh, the inspiring facilitator of Black Agenda Television. Yes, uh, Roy Singham, if you could join us, we would, uh, we would appreciate that. If you could join us. Roy, would you please join us? And Ayanna Jones from Black Wax, who made that beautiful, beautiful film, Black Agenda TV the quality that it was. Diana Jones, who's also very talented. She's a singer. She's a brilliant young woman. So we have everyone here. Diana Jones. We have everyone here. If we've left anyone out and you feel that you should be here on the stage. David Rutherford. Uh, you savior if you're here. David, who would have made uh, the kitchen duties impossible and everything else and uh, David as well as Mae Jackson uh, who donated that wonderful wonderful wine that we had uh, so we're going to say good night to everybody please let's uh, join oh you savior you savior hey hey there's nobody like you savior no so like good <laughs> <laughs> okay folks we're going to ask everybody to sort of pull in a little bit so we can get this uh, family photo here. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we're going to have Ms. Cumberbatch uh, take us up with Creator Has Say Master Plants with peace, with peace. And we wish all of you, all of you peace. And thank you so much for supporting Black Agenda Report. Thank you very much. <laughs>